so uh, we'll start with just doing um, a little bit of an intro. So I'm going to start just with, so everyone knows how to use uh, Zoom. So we're doing this as a meeting style rather than a webinar. So that way we can see anyone who wants to have their camera on. Uh, we can actually interact a little bit more and, and make it a little bit, a uh, little bit more engaging. So when you're using Zoom, uh, you can either have it in a speaker view where it'll sh be showing um, either you know, Chris, myself, or if somebody's asking a question, uh, it'll it'll bring them uh, on so you can see whoever's speaking. Uh, or you can actually do a gallery view. So at the top uh, right hand side, there's a gallery button so you can actually see um, several people all at once. So there's speaker view and there's gallery view. Uh, the other thing is that there's a chat, which we'll be using uh, for this. It's along the bottom. It's on your toolbar. So we'll be using the, the chat just to engage. And any questions that you have, if you don't mind posting them in the chat. And the one thing that we do when we do these webinars, is we ask that everyone, if you don't mind phrasing your question as, uh, my question is, and then whatever your question is. It just makes it a lot easier for us to actually determine what the question is, because sometimes people give us uh, more of an open-ended um, it's not necessarily a question, it's more of a, there's a question within however they're, they're phrasing it. So for simplicity, if you can just do my question is, we'll go with, uh, we'll go with that format. All right, so I'll start with myself, uh, introducing myself. I'm Andrew. Um, I'm, I co-authored The Conditioning Coach along with Kevin. Um, I'm the primary author of the, the Lean Body Coach and Hypertrophy Program, which we've uh, recently, you know, rolled together and turned into a more of a super program called our Body Transformation Specialist. I've been with DTS for the last uh, three years. And you know what, guys, if you don't mind muting your microphone on the way in, that would be great. Perfect. Yeah, so I've been with DTS for the last three years, been in the industry for about 14 now. Um, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of things. My, my superpower is that uh, I've got this, this awesome curiosity that so led me into a bunch of different avenues. I've competed in uh, uh, the provincial level in powerlifting. I've competed at the provincial level in, uh, in bodybuilding. I uh, was a university track athlete. I played uh, all Ontario football. I've done a lot of different things because um, I, really I really love to learn. Uh, what I'm gonna be covering is the nutrition side of performance recovery. So there's so many things that we really could be talking about, everything from um, you know, the micronutrients like zinc to different types of macronutrient ratios for different training programs. We're gonna try to keep this uh, simple and, and very useful for everyone and, and kind of covers a topic that uh, there's a lot of misconception around. And we're gonna be looking at uh, one thing in that we want people to be eating enough quality food when their goal is performance and not trying to ride two bicycles at once. There's this common misconception that somebody or people will want to get ripped or get lean uh, while also trying to increase performance. And those two goals are, are often very opposite. So you'll see somebody decide to start getting into CrossFit or some sort of uh, extreme boot camp or something like that with the goal of trying to lose weight while also perform. And you really need to, um, you know, sometimes choose which path you're going on. So with that, um, I'll, I'll let Chris introduce himself and what he'll be covering for today. Uh, hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Chris Budge, uh, DTS instructor uh, for the Barbell Strength Certification. That's kind of uh, where I lie in. Uh, I've been training for 15 years and what I'm going to be covering today um, from the recovery side is how to do a proper deload um, of your training program. I'm going to discuss the purpose behind it. I'm going to discuss how to do it and I'm going to give you little bonus pieces that can maximize when you do it to elicit a greater response in performance. And I'm excited to be here today in my office. My drive to work was about 10 seconds. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here, with, with discussing the difference between performance and uh, this idea of getting ripped. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so if we could, just in the chat, if I could, if you guys can all see my screen, if I could just get a thumbs up or a yes, if you guys can just let me know that you're able to see the current slide that I'm looking at. Perfect. All right, thanks everyone. So I took these slides from our, from our conditioning coach course and, and, and pulled them into here because um, they kind of fit with the topic perfectly. 
So we're going to start with just looking at uh, understanding energy because energy is it's the essential part that we get from food. So when we're trying to understand um, energy, we're essentially talking about metabolism because metabolism is, is just the measure of the maximum output that we've had for a given period of time. So if we look at our metabolism in, in a day or in a week, it's just the, the, uh, the total amount of output that we've had. And we tend to measure that uh, in calories, you know, with, with heat expenditure and different things like that. So the two main things that make up metabolism are our BMR and our activity level. So in our chat, I'm going to pose the question, does anyone want to take a stab at what BMR stands for? And just keep it simple. What's the simplest way to describe your basal metabolic rate? Nobody wants to take a stab at it. Well, that's good. So you're all at the right webinar. <laughs> here they come. There we go. Here we are. Okay. The amount of calories that you would need to live. Yep. Basically. Yep. It's your baseline. The, the baseline number of calories that you need just to function. Yep. And then I think it's pretty obvious what activity is beyond that. Um, activity is just how much extra you would need to function. Now stress actually can kind of get lumped into that activity, uh, that activity area as well. Uh, it's something that often people forget about. They just look at activity as a multiplier. But stress, or sorry, activity is really um, a type of stress. So different, different forms of stress actually increase our energy needs. And what's interesting is your body doesn't necessarily differentiate between um, physical stress and mental stress. So when you're actually mentally stressed, your body can actually start to allocate or dump um, more resources. You can actually start to, to flood the, the bloodstream with more nutrients, and it'll actually increase your desire for nutrients because it's anticipating needing more energy. But because the activity level is actually not there, um, you never actually end up using that energy and you end up kind of reallocating it and storing it. As well. That's just a little bonus fact for everyone. So who wants to take a stab or who wants to say, uh, or give me an idea of how accurate this representation is. So when we look at this graph, where we have our base, um, our base BMR, and then from there activity increases. And with that, so does our energy needs or our desired uh, output. Who wants to take a stab at the accuracy of this? We'll just say, you can put it in the chat. Is this, is this chart accurate or graph accurate? Yes or no? Catherine, plus or minus 25. I like that. Not, not so accurate. Every person's different. Yes. So we've got a couple of yeses and then a few, it depends. So it is accurate at the start, but then it starts to become more inaccurate. Exactly. Somebody just came in, Dave, that was, uh, it's not linear. So it starts, it starts fairly linear, but then it starts to have this tapering effect. So this is called, we're going to get into is uh, general adaptation of energy. So what that means is the energy that you produce uh, and the energy that you need to allocate will adapt to whatever stimulus it's given. So an example would be running a marathon versus a Netflix marathon. They require two completely different uh, energy needs. So if you're running a marathon, obviously you will need to produce uh, and allocate more energy towards activity. And I should say produce more energy um, towards that activity. Whereas if you're doing a Netflix marathon, you know, your BMR might be, might be enough, maybe a little bit above that, fairly sedentary. Now, this is all really dependent on nutrition and how much energy that you're taking in because how much energy that you're actually taking in uh, dictates how you'll end up allocating it. So we were correct that, uh, you know, most of the time that there's, it's not linear. So there tends to be an energy threshold. So you, you, everyone has a, a genetic ceiling or, or a biological capacity with how much energy that they can produce. And after that, we need to start adapting and reallocating and changing things from there. So let's take it to the next slide. And who wants to get, who wants to give me, who is this guy here? You can toss it in the chat. Are we familiar with this person? Phelps, yeah. Really popular. So Phelps had this, um, this article that, that spread um, like crazy. It was basically, you know, Phelps' uh, training schedule and Phelps' nutrition. And it was like, Phelps consumes like 10,000 calories a day. 
Um, and he just, you know, he does whatever he can just to get calories in because he trains so much in the pool. So a part of this, um, or determining this is, is genetics. So Phelps is obviously, uh, he, he's an Olympian. He's at the top of his game. He's a genetic outlier in that he can consume so much more energy and that allows him to increase his output. But even Phelps has a genetic ceiling. Um, it just may not be the same as, as mine or yours. So things to consider uh, when we're looking at somebody's um, ceiling or upper limit is how much are they able to train and you know, what's their lifestyle look like? Do they have kids? Uh, what's their nutrition look like? What's their sleep cycle look like? And even things like the season, uh, you'll be able to obviously you know, train more when you have more daylight. And with that tends to come more energy as well. So we have different factors that'll all play into how much our maximum output would be. And it can be different at different times. And a lot of that can kind of be boiled down to our, our total stress. So with stress, um, well, I'll get into stress in a second. So first, first, let's just look at energy allocation. So if, if we're needing to allocate energy, meaning we don't have enough energy coming in, we'll go, we'll go in the chat here. Where do we think that we allocate more energy to? Do we need to allocate more energy to vital organs? Do we need to allocate more energy to our stress response? Or do we need to allocate more energy towards uh, refueling and repairing? So that's going to be recovery. So if we want to go in the chat, you can give me your, your feedback. What do we think our body prioritizes? So we had one for recovery, one vital organs, several stress ones, organs, stress. So it seems like everyone's pretty much focusing on, on vital organs and stress. So it's actually the stress response is the one that we allocate the most to by far. And that's just because um, survival is paramount. So don't get me wrong, when I say vital organs, you know, your brain's a vital organ, but it doesn't necessarily need to operate at 100% capacity. Whereas, you know, if you need to survive some sort of, um, you know, in this picture here, we can look at survive a, a saber tooth tiger. If you need to survive some sort of event like that, that takes precedence over having 100% brain function, um, you know, even, even liver function. And I'm not saying that your liver isn't functioning. It's more the amount of energy that that, that organ would be consuming. So we can downregulate that those organs and downregulate um, you know vital organs and downregulate repair and recovery in order to meet our needs for the stress response because it's all about survival. Taylor had it there, fight or flight. So let's talk about what is stress. So with stress, I, I try to give the analogy or I try to have people think about stress as um, a pile. So when you go through the day or the month and you reflect back and, you're, and you think about how stressed was my client or how stressed am I, try to look at it as, as a pile. So you might have a lot of small items that you don't really realize, but they pile up into something larger, or you might have um, you know, a fairly low stressful life, but might you might have one major event that can really affect you. So it's important to think of uh, stress from an absolute standpoint, the total volume of stress, rather than uh, a relative standpoint. So somebody might say, you might talk to a client, you might be dealing with stress and they might say, I'm not, I'm not very stressed. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't have, a, I don't have much going on. You know, I'm happy with my wife and different things like that. And they, and they really have a great life, but they just might do a lot of things. They might have a, a hobby farm. They might have young kids. Uh, they might, you know, um, be a, a top performer at work. And even though they're a top performer and they love their job, there's still amount of stress that goes with that. And from an absolute standpoint, it can mount into something. Okay, let me just check my notes here to make sure we're, we're on track. Okay, so here's our traditional model and we've determined that there is an upper threshold. So does anyone want to, I'm just going to go back to the, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a second. Okay. And does anyone want to unmute their microphone and give me an idea of how they think the body will adapt? So we talked about general um, adaptation of energy. Who wants to unmute their microphone and give me an idea of how the body will adapt?
Any brave souls? No? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. So we looked at uh, our BMR and that basal metabolic rate, and we just talked about vital organs, um, rest and repair. Basically, when we need more energy for stress, we will end up um, reducing our BMR and pulling from vital organs. So we'll jump back in that screen. And I'm just gonna take a quick break here. I'm just gonna take a peek at the chat and see if we have any questions. Oh, so Chris, Chris left and can't get back in. Okay, let me, let me just let Chris back in here. Sorry guys, one second. Participants. Okay, there he is there. And let me just find him here. Okay. Where's Chris? Where I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? There you are. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened. I don't know either. You know what? I think we hit the, the capacity for this meeting. So we're not going to be able to admit anyone else. Okay. I think as long as you and I are here, we should be able to, I think, I think that's enough for now. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. It's so for some reason it's being capped at a uh, hundred. I actually increased it to a thousand last night, but I, I don't, I don't know why, you know, that's, that's how technology goes. So uh, we are recording it. So if you know of anyone that wanted on this, this seminar, uh, we'll make sure we post the recording and send them the recording after. Okay. So uh, let me jump back in here. And if you don't mind in the chat guys, can you just confirm, can you still see my screen? All right. Perfect. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so let me find out where we are. We are here. So essentially, this is what the, what the graph will end up looking at. This is a more accurate uh, depiction of, of what it'll look like when you start to meet the upper threshold um, of, your, of your genetic capacity or your biological capacity to produce energy. So you'll notice that your energy, uh, your energy output, which is the, 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 the total, the absolute amount, starts to really taper off uh, as our BMR starts to taper down. So that's what we mean when uh, we're talking about it reducing or pulling from vital functions. So examples of this would be things like uh, brain fog, um, you know, because your, your brain's not operating on 100% capacity. Our brain loves or consumes the vast majority of glucose um, that, we, that we utilize within a day. It's, I think it's somewhere like 20, 30%. Don't quote me on that. It's, 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 it's a large chunk for such a small um, organ. So, you know, if we reduce its capacity, obviously we'll have more brain fog. We can't think as clear, things like that. Um, it can also affect sexual desire. Um, and also you'll notice an increase in lethargy. You'll, you'll, your body is wanting to downregulate. So, you know, you'll, you'll naturally want to sleep more or be a little more lethargic. Now this can be offset by stress. If you, if you have anxiety that's keeping you going, obviously that can offset that. So I just have an example here, and we'll, we'll kind of flow through this example pretty quick. I just brought in so that we can really drive home the point that uh, performance is different than, than getting ripped. So, you know, this is pretty common. I've seen a lot of people with, with a regime like this, somebody that's doing a figure competition or a bodybuilding competition. Uh, you know, I, I took this example from, from a friend of mine that I, that I knew. She was consuming a 1,300-calorie diet. She did an hour and a half of morning cardio, an hour and a half of a midday workout, and an hour and a half of evening cardio. Uh, and she was about five weeks out from, from her competition. And that was her, her regime at that time. I'm not saying I condone that. I'm just saying that was her, her regime. It's a really good case study to, to show this point. So in theory, uh, when we calculate what she should be taking in, uh, what I did here was I just looked at what's her, what's her baseline? Uh, what should she need without exercise? So what I did was I took her BMR and I added in a sedentary, uh, an and a, a sedentary multiplier. That gave us 1,500 calories. Um, and then we add that 1500 calories to how much exercise she's doing. She should be burning about 3,800 calories, uh, per day. And she's only taking in 1300. So if you look at that deficit between 1300, uh, or I should say 3,800 and 1300 it's massive, she should be, she should be shedding weight really quick, but obviously she's not. And that's because she's down-regulated. So I'm just gonna jump back to this graph here. So she's sitting closer to this end over here. 
if you guys can see my mouse, she's sitting on the right far, the right side of that graph. So even though she's exercising so much more and she's increasing her activity dramatically, all this, and all this really happening is her basal metabolic rate. She's just robbing herself um, from that area because she's, she's kind of met her upper threshold. So for every 100 calories that she thinks that she's burning extra, maybe her net total is only 10. Uh, that's an arbitrary number just to drive home the point that, you know, it, it's not as simple as more and more output, more and more output. So when we bring that back to performance, um, you know, when we're thinking about maximum performance, it's not the same as maximum output. So maximum output, or I should say high output is something that you're chasing when your goal is to get lean or get ripped or, or, or whatever from there. Um, it's not the same as maximum performance. So when you start, sorry, yeah, maximum performance. So maximum performance, essentially when we hit that point, um, we'll hit it, as soon as we start to reach the upper threshold, generally right before, we tend to want to taper back a little bit. Now that could be from, uh, you know, having some sort of uh, way that we stress the management routine. It could be, um, you know, different training, uh, periodized training programs, things like that. It could also mean, um, you know, we may need more food until we reach that, that, that upper limit. So just bear in mind that when the goal is maximum performance, we want to focus on um, the quality not the total volume, not the quantity, because total volume or quantity can end up pushing us too far to the right. Uh, whereas when we focus on quantity, uh, sorry, quality, then it keeps us a little bit more towards the maximum performance zone because we don't want to end up over overreaching um, or overtraining. Now, sometimes that is a model um, that, that people do, and I'll let Chris dive into that training. I really want to get into Chris's segue in a second, but essentially this all comes down to what we, we like to use at DTS is demand equals capacity. We have to look at, um, especially when it's performance-based, we have to look at what's that person's capacity and we have to operate within that capacity. As soon as we start exceeding it, now performance will actually start to decline because we're, we're robbing ourselves of, 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 vital, of vital energy and function. So I'm gonna open it up to a, to a Q&A and if you don't mind phrasing your question as my question is, and I'm going to jump, you can just toss it in the chat if you have a question and we'll give everyone about a minute to do that. And then we'll start to segue into Chris's because Chris is going to cover the whole training aspect of things and why a deload is so important. Okay, so Pamela, because you're our first question, um, I will give you, I'll give you some grace, but if we, everyone could phrase their question as my question is this. So she's asking, uh, are genetics involved? A absolutely. That, so that, that was the whole point of the Michael Phelps slide. Michael Phelps is a genetic outlier. Most people can't just consume, you know, 10,000 calories a day and train at the volume that he's, that he's doing. Um, you know, it, it's most people have a genetic limit or genetic capacity that's, that's much less than that. Ryan, my question is, what does maximum performance refer to? So yes, yeah, so let's, let's talk about that. Performance, performance could be uh, the different ways that you might measure performance in, in a gym might be uh, some sort of cardiorespiratory performance or strength performance. So we could look at different assessments, uh, like a strength assessment where we have um, you know, a, a, an R, a repetition maximum. Uh, for cardiorespiratory, it could be something like a beep test. Uh, we have got a bunch of different assessments in our, um, in our conditioning coach. And in that actually, we, we, we give the different assessments for you know, strength, anaerobic capacity, aerobic capacity, and things like that as well. So essentially performance is how well can you perform? And then it's going to be relative to the person. Okay. And we've got four more questions here that I'll cover. And I'm just going to cap the questions there um, at Simona. So Kyle, my question is how accurate do you find watches are for calculating calorie output for activity? You know what, Kyle, man, it's uh, not, not very accurate, but I can tell you that calorie counting in general is not accurate. Uh, it's generally about a 20% variance plus or minus. It's a huge, it's a huge variance. Uh, you know, even with what you read on a nutrition label, because you have to remember, you know, when you look at an apple and it says an apple's, um, you know, 100, 120 calories for the portion size that you think, or for a Macintosh or something like that. Um, it's not always that amount. It can, it, it varies on the size and the weight. Um, and obviously how much of the apple you eat, if you're that type of person that eats the entire apple, including the core, it's more. If you're that person that doesn't like to get near the core at all, it's less. So 
it, 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 it varies, it varies dramatically. Uh, what matters is consistency. Next one is Dave. My question is, can you list any resources for additional reading slash investigation? Yeah. So you know what, uh, at the end, I will we'll go over some additional resources and some of the different things that we like. Uh, Kathy, my question is how long and how, sorry. My question is how low and high intensity sports change? Spot of energy. Yeah, you know what, Kathy? So, so that's an energy to specific. You, you can almost, um, you can look up different ways to calculate calories for, diff for different activities. I would suggest, you know, there's bountiful ways that you can, that you can go, you know, find a, a baseline multiplier and look at different things like that. So um, if you have more questions about, about that in terms of how to actually calculate someone's capacity, shoot, feel free to shoot me an email and, and we can chat about that a little bit more. My question is, does max output refer to maximal effort? Which one is more important? So, Simona, um, I'm just, I just need a little bit more clarity. So you can either type this in the chat or you can just take yourself off mute. When you say maximum effort, uh, are, you are you talking about uh, maximum effort uh, of a single lift, like your 1RM? Or are you talking about maximum effort over, over a period of time? Right? Because performance is, ends up being relative um, to what it, however we're gauging it. So if, if, the, if it's a max effort, uh, one RM, um, out output still matters, but not as much as it necessarily might, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, a, a marathon runner, cause a marathon runner is still doing maximum effort, but it's just over, uh, over a different duration of time. So that, that kind of depends. Um, yeah, I think she wrote, I think she wrote maximum effort one repetition max. Yeah. So will, will you're, yeah. Okay. So, okay. So I think what you're asking is, um, the output slide that we're looking at, um, how does that affect your, your one RM? So your one RM, it would be affected if you're, if you're over training or you're overreaching, meaning you're getting into that, um, you're exceeding your capacity, then you'll start to notice a decline in performance, which will affect your one RM. That's how it would get affected. If in terms of your one RM, um, where it fits on the chart, it's not, um, it's not a huge, oh, that's what I'm looking for. It's not a huge output exercise. Uh, it's, a, it's a large output in that it's, it's neural, it, you know, for the time it lasts, which is, uh, I don't know, five seconds, six seconds, um, maybe four, depending on, on the person. So, you know, it, from a total time perspective, it's a high use of energy for four seconds, five seconds. It's obviously not the same as a marathon that lasts an hour. Um, where it does get affected though, in terms of performance is if somebody's eating too little or they're overtraining too much, then you'll notice a decline in that performance. Okay. So we're going to cap the questions there. Guys, you're welcome to reach out to me, uh, personally, I'll give my contact information, uh, at the end of this seminar. And we're going to turn it over to Chris to get into our, um, performance training. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. That was very informative. Appreciate that on my side. I even learned a thing or two. Um, so moving on now, we're going to talk about the training aspect of it. So with the training aspect, we will program in on purpose training to elicit a response, and then we'll program in something known as a deload. I'm sure we've all heard of deloading your training, deloading the stimulus, deloading something. So in the questions, I want someone to answer in the chat, what is a deload? What's the purpose of a deload? So you, if you know what the purpose of a deload is, please type that up. What is the purpose of a deload in a training program? Let's see what we got here. Prevent overtraining. Recovery with a question mark. Recovery from a strength phase to give the body extra time to recover, to decrease training load. Oh, Netflix, prep for more load. Recover, 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 recover. Do you see a common trend? The term everyone's using is a deload is recovery. I don't even call them deloads. I call them recovery weeks because the number one purpose is to allow the athlete or the client to recover from the previous stimulus. So when we look at the previous stimulus, that is the training program. When they do the training program, whether it's a strength phase, high intense endurance phase, whatever it is, that exercise is going to challenge the body. It's going to push the body, push, 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 push. And then what happens from a physiological standpoint is if you continue to push and you don't give the body any time to recover, it is going to break down. 
And what does breakdown look like? It looks like an injury. It looks like something feels funny. It looks like sleep is then thrown off. It looks like appetite is thrown off. It looks like performance is thrown off. So what we can do in the training industry is we can actually choose when to do certain blocks where the focus is to recover. So the best analogy I use, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Do, 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 do. You can all see my whiteboard here. My favorite analogy for training and overtraining is revolutions of your engine, RPMs of an engine. So when everyone drives their vehicle, you'll see RPMs from 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 3,000, 2. So if you're, if you're driving your car and you rev your engine on average, you're probably going to be hanging around you know, 2,500 to 3,500 for your engine. Now, every now and then you got to accelerate, you got to race that guy or girl on the highway. You might push it to five or six. But then what happens is if you continually for too long, if you're pushing the limits at 6,000, 7,000 RPMs of your engine, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to blow your engine. Maybe not right away, but in time, the, the, the lifeline of your car is going to be a lot less. So in training, it's a similar concept. If you're always up here in this area, you're going to burn out. You're going to get an injury. So what we want to do is we want to actually plan some form of recovery. So planned recovery would look more like this. I like using this model here. Where you can then build on. So if we're looking at a staircase model, we could have week one of training, week two of training, week three of training, week four of training. And then all of a sudden, we take week five and we make it a little bit easier. Then we could go back up to week six and then we could even, you know, go harder on that week seven. But this is going to be the key thing is you're planning some form of easier workouts. So what can we do to actually make a workout a little bit easier? So in the question area, the chat area, what are some things that we could do to make a workout easier? Decrease total tonnage. Reduce weight. What else we got there? Uh, reduce weight, decrease total tonnage, mobility exercises, total volume of weights, increase the rest periods, reduce CNS, central nervous system damage, tempo. Okay, I'm going to address a few of these things right now. So you got to remember, the goal of a recovery week is to change your training stimulus to make it easier so that your body actually recovers. Your connective tissues are stronger. Your energy stores are then going to be a little bit higher. When you go into your next block of training, you're better than before. So what is the number one metric that is going to push people? Just decrease volume, not load. So volume is always going to be your number one driver to either getting stronger or getting weaker or getting injured. So you have to be able to track your volume. So tracking volume is actually a very simple concept. Do, 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 do. Go back to my whiteboard. Just give me a second. So a very simple way to actually track your volume is math. So you could take a standard strength training principle, five sets of five um, at 100 pounds. Um, that is going to equal uh, 2,500 pounds of volume. So let's say that was done on week one. And then on week two, someone is going to increase that with um, five sets of six at 100 pounds, then all of a sudden you are going to, oops, then all of a sudden you're gonna see a higher amount of volume now at the 3,000. So if you just continue on that route, you're always gonna be doing more volume. Well, at one point, you gotta bring it back a little bit. You can't continuously keep pushing that. So when we bring it back, we have to track it first and then go backwards from there. Just a second, let me get out of my screen. So let me share some photos. So if everyone can see this right now, I have um, an example of a client's program. And then there's a few key things I want you to look at here. So I'm just going to zoom in. So you got to remember my background specifically, or one thing that I do a lot of is I train um, strength athletes, uh, power lifters. So it's very important to actually be tracking these metrics, how much are they lifting, what's their average weights, all that jazz. So I go into a lot of detail, but the key thing to look at is how much is someone actually lifting? So 
just pay attention to this blue thing here. So on the far left, we have the actual exercise, squats, bench, conventional deadlift. Then what we have is we have the reps, sets, weights, percentage of their 1RM, tempo, and then we have over here a couple things that are really interesting. We have the total lifts, that's the total amount of reps. We then have the total tonnage, how much are they actually lifting? So when I have those key things, all I need to do is reduce something. I gotta make it a little bit easier. So when I look at the bottom part of my screen on this screen specifically, that was one second. On this screen specifically, if I zoom out a little bit. So I've done the math already. So when I'm looking at um, the squat for this particular athlete, if you look at the bottom part here, it'll show 34 slash 3040 slash 89. So what that is, is that athlete is doing 34 reps that day, accumulating 3000 kilos. That's the total volume. The average set is going to be 89 kilos. So you can see it gets harder towards the end, easier in the beginning. So we do the same thing with the bench press. We do the same thing with the deadlift. And then we see over here, that is the combined tonnage of that workout, 7,275 kilograms. So how can I make a deload or recovery week more effective? I have to reduce some of those numbers. Let's take a look at what that could look like. So if I move over here, doo -doo -doo -doo. so this would be recovery. If you look at the top of the program there, it says week 2.4 recovery. So I made a few modifications here. So I'm just going to zoom in so we can all see a little bit better. So we look down at the bottom, the, the squat numbers are different, the bench numbers are different, and the deadlift numbers are different. So what I actually did was I just reduced some of the total lifts. So if you look at the squat, there's 16 reps. So 16 total lifts. Let's go with uh, red on this one. So down here, we've got 16 total lifts. And then we have for the bench press, we've got 20 total lifts. And then for the deadlift, we've reduced that as well. So the total lifts numbers are now all less. I've actually reduced some of the sets. So there's five sets over here in the squat when the previous week had six sets. And the key thing is that my total volume is down. Now, if some of you were talking about, you know, um, keep load but reduce volume, that is one way to do it. Or they could still be lifting high percentages or the higher percentages and you just reduce the total amount of volume. And you can do that by taking out one or two sets or reducing a few reps. So they're still getting the idea of lifting, you know, uh, a heavier weight on a regular basis. However, a common fault people will make when they write a, a recovery week or a deload is they will actually reduce the weight. They'll reduce the weight, but they will increase the reps. And what ends up happening is the volume then exceeds the previous week. So if they were doing 7,000 kilos on week three, then all of a sudden they do 10,000 kilos on week four, they're actually doing more volume. So they're stressing their body more. So that's not a proper way to do a recovery week or a deload week. At the same time, what we can do is we can take the assistance exercises and reduce them as well. So if I had programmed in five sets of rows, and say three sets of um, a hamstring exercise, I could program in two sets of rows and two sets of hamstring exercises. So they're still doing the same exercise, but you've reduced the total amount of workload on the body. A common fault is people will take a, a deload week, a recovery week, and they will add exercises. So they'll add in things they were never doing before, or they'll increase the total volume. So then the athlete or the client comes back after doing a, a deload week and they have new muscle soreness because they did exercises they hadn't done before. So that's a fault. They're not gonna be able to maximize their performance when they're doing that aspect. Are we all good with that? A couple thumbs up. Yeah, okay, I'll take it, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Okay, cool, let me get out of that one there. So when you're looking at programming and stuff, that's a simple concept, is that you have to be able to take the total work that people are doing and you gotta cut that down. And you can do it from reducing sets, reducing reps, reducing the percent. 
Um, so Dave asked, what percent would you um, suggest reducing? So I hate answering questions with it depends, but you know what, it depends. So in, in that aspect, um, whatever keeps the total volume less is key, but there's a lot of good research around reducing about 40%. So if you take the total workload and it's uh, 20,000 pounds over two workouts and you reduce it by 40%, you're going to see someone around that 14,000 pounds over two workouts, not one workout. So 40% is a good number. And if you look at that example that we just had there, um, it was, I think it is actually like 44% uh, from that athlete. So I told you the purpose of the deload and the recovery part. And then how to do it is reducing those things there. So reduce the total volume. So sets, reps, the percent that they're using. The assistance work has to be reduced. Another thing you can do is actually take a day out. You can reduce the amount of days they're exercising. So if someone's on a four day a week program during recovery week, you would write a three day a week program. And what can they do on that other day? Well, that goes now to my third point of maximizing recovery. These are these little bonus pieces here. So the training aspect, you've adjusted all the training. In the chat, I want you to list some other things that an athlete or a client could do to increase their recovery on that one week. So let's just hear a few thoughts we might have. Sauna. Oh, I wonder why Melissa would say sauna. Sleep focus, sleep, training in the water, foam rolling, they see me rolling, fascial stretch, swimming, yoga, contrast showers, infrared sauna, nutrition, FST, awesome, 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 awesome. These are all really good things that people can do during that time period. So um, sleep is a huge component. It's a huge component of adaptation. When we sleep, we produce hormones like growth hormone, testosterone at higher levels, and that allows us to recover from our training that we had. So in a perfect world, clients, athletes are getting good sleep on a regular basis. So they can maximize every week, not just the recovery week. But here's a little tip that I will give to someone when I say, hey, you've got a recovery week coming up. Recovery week's coming up. I want you to go to bed a half hour earlier each day if you can, and I want you to wake up a half hour later if you can. I want you to look at your schedule and see if you can schedule in a 20 minute nap periodically. I want you to adjust your schedule to make sure that your sleep environment is going to be good for that week. And if you're looking for some um, uh, simple resources there, there's a book called The Circadian Code, which is phenomenal it's by Sacha Panda. There's another book there, Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker. Um, there's a handful of things that you can do to make your environment better to recover from sleep. But sleep should be prioritized in training anyway. But if you're going to emphasize that during recovery week, simple tips like that. Andrew, you, you know a lot about sleep. Do you want to add anything to that piece? Oh, you know what, man? I, 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 think, I think keeping the, the webinar concise on, on the cert certain topics, that way people walk away with those main things is good. I think you covered sleep pretty good. And uh, it's funny, you, you just mentioned those books and I literally just, I literally just wrote them down because they asked for, for some resources and I was like, oh, what are the good, what are the good items? So I literally just wrote down uh, those two books, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker and Circadian Code by uh, Sachin Panda. So uh, I, I, we'll come back to those resources uh, when we wrap up the webinar. Okay, cool. So let's continue on. So, um, so sleep is one key component. Massage, Cairo, um, uh, uh, ART, different modalities of recovery or treatment should be prioritized in that week. When do we usually book a massage? When do we book a Cairo? When do we book these appointments? When something's wrong. I will coach clients to be proactive. Your recovery week is in two weeks. I want you to schedule now either treatment that you get from an allied uh, healthcare professional, or I want you to, to actually schedule in a 90 minute or 60 minute massage. I want you to actively do that. Chris, I don't have any time. No problem. Cause your five day a week program is only down to three days a week. So during that week, you now have the time. Use that training block to book a, a massage, to book something to allow your body to recover. So if you are proactive, then a little bit sneaky. If you are proactive, then you don't have to wait till something's wrong 
to get some treatment. So that's part of the plan, part of the recovery week. Another thing that was mentioned before was saunas. And uh, the person who actually mentioned it does use saunas in a recovery protocol. And I'll tell you a little story. I had the privilege of learning um, uh, powerlifting programming and coaching from Boris Shiko. Boris Shiko um, was a uh, Russian weightlifting coach and powerlifting coach at the national level for about two decades. And one of the key concepts they had is bath days. They call them bath days. So all the athletes do no weight training. Once out of every 14 days, they spend an entire day in these bath houses. So it's all heat related, saunas, whirlpools, massages. It's part of their recovery program. So learning that from him, he said the key concept was on a regular basis, they're doing this so they're not overtraining their body. And I started implementing that with myself, with, with athletes, with clients. And if you do well with heat, then that is something you can do. If you do well with cold, then that is something you can do as well. But again, we want to be proactive on this stuff here and plan it in. Um, another thing to work there is the, the nutrition aspect of it. So, Andrew, can you take over on this piece here? I'm doing a recovery week, so my total training intensity is going to be less. My volume is going to be down. What kind of modifications might I want to do for my nutrition? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people um, get confused here because they think my activity, my output's going down. So should I then be also consuming less? And you're probably going to stay fairly consistent with, with what you're consuming. You're probably actually not going to downregulate it because you, at this point you want to have a little bit extra is probably a good thing. A little bit of a surplus will actually help make guarantee that you recover because the goal is recovery, you know, not, not get ripped. So you want to make sure that you have enough. So probably sitting, staying consistent as you bring down your, your calories is a good thing. Um, you know, and, and then making sure your, um, you know, you're, you're, lever you're leveraging different uh, macronutrients appropriately, that you're getting enough protein, um, enough carbohydrates, you know, some good quality fats, and I would say quality, quality food overall. Don't try to, you know, rely on, on uh, Pop-Tarts -tart, Pop -tarts post-workout and things like that. So, because micronutrients still play a role in, in recovery. So, quality and enough. The same, the same kind of piece that, that I mentioned before, making sure that you're getting enough food and quality food. Yeah, and I, and I think it's also a good thing to mention it. During a recovery week, if you actually program less physical fitness, they now have this additional amount of time. So with this extra time, I mentioned you could program in recovery tools such as massage. massage. You could also program in time to make food, prepare your food, learn to cook, small things like that to increase your nutrition moving forward. Because a lot of people will say, I grabbed the Pop-Tart because I just ran out of time. So if you reduce one workout, now you've got another option to put something else in that's going to help them maximize their recovery. So just to summarize, deloads, we like to call them recovery weeks. So the sole purpose is to recover and then allow the body to be in a better position moving into its next block or its next week of training. How do we do that? We have to decrease the total volume. And how do we decrease the total volume? reduce sets or reps or percent or frequency or the actual assistance exercise. Someone mentioned before about uh, tempo. You can remove the tempo. Keep the weight the same. Just remove the tempo because then the time under tension becomes less, so it's less stress for the total body. But if you remove the tempo, don't jump the weights up because that might be too much volume for the person. And then the bonus things to maximize the recovery is actually being proactive and programming in recovery work such as additional mobility, massage. Someone mentioned, uh, what about cryotherapy? We're not gonna go down the rabbit hole of which one is best, which one's been proven to work. If you already know what makes your body feel good and perform better, do one of those. So the bonus pieces, upping the sleep if you can, saunas, um, maximizing your nutrition, getting massage work. So those are the, the key three things to maximize your recovery from a training perspective. Andrew, anything to add? Oh, man, I think that's good. I think that those are great takeaways. Um, I, we've got a couple. Are you okay with doing a, a and a I'd love Q&As. Okay, so I've, I've already wrote down a few, a few that came in along the way. Uh, guys, those questions are now buried in the chat. So if you don't mind um, unmuting your microphone and just at, re repeating your, um, your question to Chris, and then we can try to tackle it. So the first one I have is uh, Dave. 
Dave McCullough. Dave, if you don't mind unmuting your microphone and asking your question, that would be great. Oh, okay. Um, when we're doing, doing the uh, recovery week, I assume that the body recovering is utilizing some of the calories that I would have used um, if I had been doing the increased activity. So during the recovery week, I'm burning fewer calories because it's, it's the recovery week. But doesn't the body repairing and recovering itself utilize some of those, those same calories? Do you want me to take it, Chris? Yeah, you, you're a nutrition guy. You probably yeah, 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 yeah. You're 100% you're right, uh, Dave. It, it absolutely does. It, but it, it's probably not, um, you know, it, it's not going to be this, this massive upkick. Because throughout the whole program, you're you're recovering. Um, it's essentially, you know, we want to make sure that you're not over overreaching or overtraining. Uh, so, you know, it, basically a planned recovery is making sure that you're never exceeding capacity. So you're always bringing yourself down a little bit um, and also allowing yourself a little bit of a slingshot back out. You're, you're correct that um, you would be using some of those calories for, uh, for recovery, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not going to be, it's, it's probably not making up the the change in, in, in training. Uh, but again, having that, having that surplus or that extra is a, is more of a benefit because you want to make sure that you have enough that that's more of a priority than trying to reduce it to, to match it. it. It's, it's trying to hit a moving target. It, it, it's really hard. That's why we just say, if you keep it consistent, um, that's, that's the ideal. So to, just to tag onto that, to simplify it with um, like what I would do with someone, if I'm working with a client or an athlete and body composition is not their priority, let's say performance and strength is their priority. During a recovery week, I might even suggest go to a buffet. Find a place where you can get a surplus of quality food and ingest more food than normal. So you will meet the demands, the minimal requirements of calories, but then you're going to have a bit of a surplus. So your body's going to really recover now. Because it's hard to recover at a deficit. Am I right, Andrew? Yeah. So I hope that helps. Next question. Uh, the next one was uh, from Pamela Patterson. Pamela, do you mind unmuting yourself and asking the question? I can't remember what my question was. <laughs> Not, okay, no problem, no problem. <laughs> it went back there. Um, sorry. Yeah, no problem, question. no problem. Yeah, we can move on to the next one. We can That's an easy answer. Uh, the next one was from... Uh, Daryl, Daryl, uh, I can't read my own writing here. Raise, rise. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, what are like, I guess some safe and efficient ways to, uh, I guess, retrieve a client's uh, one rep max besides the, I guess the 10 reps, the, I guess, is, would it be like the 10 reps and then calculating the 0 0.6 times it by 0 0.6 or 0.7? Um, yeah, that, that's kind of an easy one. So the question was, how do you like, determine someone's one rep max? And you said you could do a 10 rep max and then use a mathematical formula. So when I started out, everything was, was pen and paper. But now I've got this thing in my house, the internet. So I use the internet because you can easily find a, a max 1RM calculator online. So you don't have to do the math yourself. So you could have someone do a 10RM, but you can have someone do a 5RM as well, or a 4RM or a 3RM. The closer it is to an actual one repetition max, the more accurate it's going to be. So if someone maxes out at 10 reps, that's kind of far from one. So whatever number comes, be aware there's going to be a larger skew than if they actually maxed out at a 5RM or a 3RM. And a protocol that we teach in our barbell strength certification is when we do these tests, instead of pushing a newer lifter or a new athlete to an actual one rep max, we put guidelines on it. So five is a really good number. There's tons of research around five for strength and for predicting one RMs. So we'll actually have the clients do a five repetition max, and we will actually cap the exercise, not at full maximum, like they could have done two or they, they could never have done one more, but we'll say if form breaks down or the bar speed drops significantly, we call it there. And we take that number and we just Google five reps at 100 pounds, estimate a one RM, and we get that specific number. We can use that to base percents off of. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay, the next one was uh, Timothy Lowe. Timothy, if you don't, if you, there you go. Yes, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, hi, Chris. Long time no see. Hey, Tim, you, you, you look different. Do you, can you see my... Uh, no. Anyway. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. oh, there you are. Oh, oh, yeah. Tim. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I noticed that the... Uh, yeah, anyways. Yeah, so my question was, um, how's... Uh, steady state cardio in the role of recovery weeks and strength training or just thoughts on steady state cardio in general uh, Andrew you want to hit that yeah so you know what it, um, the, the thing with steady it's not okay you can do it but you have to make sure that you're not giving your body different messages so you have to look at it like um, you know how we get stronger or, or whenever we're trying to perform, if, if we're specifically talking about getting stronger, um, steady state cardio, if steady state cardio can start to pull um, from that adaptation. So essentially what we're doing is we're training and we use training, training parameters to try to elicit a, spe a specific adaptation from the body. So we will be lifting uh, essentially heavier weights um, over a shorter duration of time, a much shorter duration of time to elicit the adaptation to get stronger. If we then go and then we do an endurance exercise, we're now giving the body two different, two different things to work on. So it will actually reduce the amount um, of improvement that we could have seen from just strength training. Uh, if the goal is, you know, kind of a hybrid system where you need to do both, like if you're a CrossFitter, then it, it may not be just maximal, you know, maximal strength at a time. You know, you may have to be able to uh, have a good bench press and run a one mile fairly quick. You know, so it kind of depends. Uh, it's going to be specific to the client. But if the objective is performance in terms of strength, you don't want to pull yourself or, or, or get away from that, um, you know, that adaptation. If, if it goes the opposite as well, if your goal is more endurance, you know, the adaptation is going to be more endurance. So, you know, doing one RM squats when your goal is to, to improve your, um, you know, your, your marathon time, it, it may, not be, may not be conducive. Um, so you want to try to keep it specific. Now, that being said, you know, really low intensity. Like if we're talking about brisk walking, it, there's not enough intensity there to really cause an adaptation. So you could do things like brisk walking. Uh, that's, that's fine. So we, what we want to be mindful of is giving mixed signals when it comes to uh, the adaptation that you're going to receive. So steady state can absolutely be done when strength is the goal, but the intensity has got to be low. Yeah, and I, I can speak on that from a specific situation. I've had a client during a recovery week decide to say, hey, I'm just going to do an incline walk on a treadmill. And in her head, she thought it was super low intensity. But guess what? She does an incline walk on treadmills regularly. So it went for like a 40-minute incline walk on like 15. And then her hamstrings and her calves were shot for like five days. So she did something she thought was easy, but it was so different than what she had done before that it ended up actually being too much stimulus to be effective for recovery week. I see. Awesome. Thanks guys. Uh, the next one was, um, uh, Jared, this one's for you, Chris, Jared, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. Yeah. So, um, my question was like an overall percentage. So you're telling us to either deload reps, weight, um, overall weight, uh, time under tension. But is there like a percentage of like what to actually uh, reduce that deload by? Yeah, 40 is a very simple one that you could do. So you could take a look at the entire week, the entire week's tonnage, reduce it by 40%. That will work. That will work for anyone. Now the caveats are, at what point in their training block are they? Are they competing? So are they, are they eight weeks out versus 16 weeks out? Because if someone is eight weeks out, you may not want to reduce that volume that much unless the next block they're going into is, is going to be still relatively high volume. So that's where it might be a little bit of a caveat, but 40% is a general guideline that will work for most people. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The next one is Cynthia, Cynthia, Cynthia head. All right, I think we're gonna skip oh, these. Sorry, Andrew, That's can you okay. hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. 
Um, now I have to think back to my question. Sorry, I didn't want to do this, but it was about endurance training. Um, typical race plans are 12 weeks. Would you schedule a deload into that 12 week program? Are you talking about a deload of a uh, running volume or a deload of resistance training? Could be both because most of my programs have a strength component. Yeah, so for sure, um, any running coach would then have a reduced period of training volume from running. So their mm -hmm. mileage would, would be reduced at one point over 12 weeks. Um, unless you are a absolute beginner and you're doing like the, the walk to run program, right? Where you might not actually run a full, you know, a full five kilometers until, you know, week 10. So that would be a little bit different where someone might not do that. But if you are an active runner, there's going to be, or it should be a time period in there where you're reducing the total volume or mileage they're doing. As for the resistance training, absolutely the same thing. The resistance training for running is to keep you strong and injury free. So when you're, when you're pushing the resistance training and you're not recovering, the same thing could happen whether you are a strength athlete or a runner. So you should still program in a recovery week. Now, just a caveat for anyone who's listening, I didn't say when to do it. For some people, they need it every four weeks. Some need it every five weeks. Some need it every six weeks. So when you start out with someone, a general guideline is to give them a low amount of exercise week one. And then every week, add a little more volume, add a little more volume, add a little more volume, and see when does performance start to hinder. So that could show up as you know, a weight that didn't feel that heavy, on week four, the exact same weight feels really heavy on week five. So that's an indication that, okay, the body is probably good for a recovery week on week five. And, but if they keep going up, then you can just keep, keep pushing it. But on average, most people with resistance training and strength training, they will need a recovery week between the, the weeks of week four and week six. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next one is Simona. Hey guys, uh, you kind of uh, already answered the question when we were talking about uh, when with Timothy's question. So uh, it was just in relation to steady state versus uh, sprinting during leaning out, which one is better or um, if there should be a preference. Yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tackle this one, Simona. So uh, both are great and they, and they kind of do two different things. So the problem with steady state cardio is that you tend to adapt to it really quick. So what ends up happening um, with that ad adaptation is the output that you once got from it starts to dramatically decrease. But steady state cardio is still excellent for when you're trying to increase um, overall output. So when somebody's trying to get lean, overall output still matters. So you're still gonna have to um, utilize some sort of steady state, whether it's ultra low intensity with longer durations like, uh, like incline walking or, or brisk walking or something like that. Um, you could still utilize 70% you know, of heart rate and things like that too. You might just have to do a mixed modality, meaning uh, you might have to change whatever style that you're doing, um, whether it's you know, some, a, a cross trainer, um, jogging, a rower, you, you might have to alternate things to make sure that it stays effective. Um, and the goal, what you're getting from there is, again, like I said, is, is duration, which increases um, output because the goal is to increase um, the total output over the course of a day or week. What steady, or sorry, what um, high intensity allows you to do is um, in, in two parts. High intensity training uh, basically signals your body to, to expect like extreme um, bouts of, or need for energy. So it'll actually start, um, it'll start dumping more fatty acids into the bloodstream and glucose into the bloodstream, which is really good because that's, that's what we want to use, utilize that. So it's really good for what's called fat mobilization. So you will mobilize more fatty acids, meaning dump more energy into your blood and get ready to use it. Um, but the, the trade-off is with intensity, um, you know, intensity, intensity affects the ability to recover. So you have to start managing how much high intensity that you're giving the client because we don't want them to, we don't want to start pushing them again to that right side of the curve where we're now putting them in a deficit because um, we want to keep them, keep them going and, and doing well and, op and operating effectively. So when we're trying to get lean, we use both. 
Um, you know, and it kind of, it depends a little bit. I hate, I hate using that answer, but um, how we utilize it would really depend on the person's ability to recover. Um, but yeah, we would, we would end up utilizing both. A really, you know, a little bit of a bonus, a really effective system that a lot of people utilize um, is using some sort of high intensity training to help uh, mobilize free fatty acids. Uh, and then, you know, having it followed up by some sort of low intensity steady state. So it might look like a Tabata on the roller followed by a 20 minute walk. Because there you're getting the benefit of both. Um, and the intensity of the steady state is not high enough that it's, that it's really demanding. If anything, it really helps aid in recovery. So you get the mobilization of free fatty acids and the high intensity from, um, and the caloric output from the, um, the rower. And then when we would transition to like the walking or the low intensity, um, it helps aid recovery, brings down the heart rate and we still increase total output. There's a little bit of a bonus for you. Uh, the last question we have is, uh, Chris, sorry, do you have anything to add to that before I... No, nope, that was awesome. Okay, uh, Tejnur, I hope I said that right. Close enough. Um, so my question was, overall, how long do you program a deload for? Because I've never formally programmed one in just because some sort of break or vacation ends up happening where you just naturally get some sort of recovery. And I was taught two weeks, but I've never really addressed it. Um, so can I ask you, uh, who, are, who are your average clientele? Who are you working with? What kind of people? Uh, not athletes. Okay. So like, like personal training clients, general population? Yeah. Yeah. So with Gen Pop, it, it's really easy to, they, they will give you, um, uh, recovery weeks. They will tell you. They will say, oh, I have a vacation lined up. I'm going down south here. Or um, they might come in on a, on a Monday and be like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to be here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because I've got something else going on. So in an ideal world, if you know in advance when they're going to take their vacation, you can rev them up right before because their, va their vacation will be their recovery week. And unfortunately, if you don't know when they're going to take the time off and they come in on a Monday and they say, I'm not going to be here for the rest of the week or they get sick, you can't plan for it. So again, it's all about trying to be proactive and know when it's going to happen. So let's say you know when it's going to happen. An average person will really only need about, about five to seven days of a recovery week. Um, it's at low levels, it could even be three to four days. For an athlete, when we would Put in a, a recovery week usually it's four workouts so we're doing a 20-week block of training and they they take a recovery week every four weeks and you're going to say okay i'm going to rev them right up then they got that recovery rev them up then they have that recovery week there but one week tends to be like a, a good a good amount the only time where it would go beyond is when someone has pushed themselves to their max so they've been training for the iron man and they do the iron man They've been training for a weightlifting competition and they go all out. Afterwards, depending on how badly the body's beat up, that's where two weeks can be effective. But for our general population people, use, and you're already doing this, use their vacations that they're gonna go on and just you know push them really hard before the vacations because they're gonna sit on the beach, have a calorie surplus, an alcohol surplus, probably get better sleep as well, and they come back into the gym and be rested and ready to train a little harder then. Is that good? Super helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Okay guys, so we're gonna, we're gonna end it there. Um, we'll just give you a, a few resources uh, for you guys to look at. So Chris had already mentioned uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, which is an excellent resource uh, on sleep. It pairs really well with circadian code. Um, Chris, have you read Circadian Code? Yeah. 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 So I, so I, I read, uh, I learned about some of that stuff from, from a different book. So I haven't read that book yet, but I know Chris and, uh, and Kevin highly recommend that book. Um, another good one is, uh, uh, Ben Greenfield's book called Boundless. Um, it's kind of a, uh, you know, one of those ones where it, it, it dives into a lot of different topics, uh, basically different things that help with performance recovery and different things like that. Kind of the, you know, the superhuman approach, different, different things that you can do. Um, but Ben does a pretty good job at, at breaking down some of the science um, in terms of how things work and how really effective they, they are and managing expectations with, um, you know, what different approaches might elicit. Another good one, uh, for those of you interested in um, high intensity training, interval training, 
Uh, Marty Gabala, who's, who's a Canadian over at McMaster, wrote a book called The One Minute Workout. It's filled with uh, really good nuggets about high intensity interval training, um, you know, understanding how it works, the research that's got us to where we are today, kind of where the field is going. And it has lots of good resources that you can actually utilize with clients. Um, everyone from, uh, you know, beginner to, to advanced. A lot of people think that high intensity interval training is for advanced people. Um, but high intensity ends up being relative to the person. Uh, really, if you exceed 80% of heart rate of your heart rate, you're getting in your high intensity. And then it's just a matter of, of how high you go in duration. So what people sometimes forget is that, you know, for a 60 year old, um, Betty, she, when she goes up the stairs, one full flight of stairs, it gets her heart rate, let's say to 80 beyond 80%, um, maximum heart rate. So that would mean one flight of stairs is essentially, um, high intensity training for Betty. So if Betty does a flight of stairs, recovers for two, three, four minutes or whatever the appropriate time is, and then does another flight of stairs. Um, hey Maggie. Hey. She does another flight of stairs. That's essentially intervals. So she's now doing high intensity interval training. So it ends up being relative to the client. So he does a great job of that. Um, do you want to add any other books, Chris? No, <laughs> no, sorry, I can't think of anything. I think that's a good amount of reading for some people. Yeah, so there's, there's four good books that all kind of talk about um, performance and recovery. In terms of uh, like courses, if you're looking to do any courses, uh, you know, precision, if you're looking to, to learn more about nutrition, precision nutrition is always excellent. Uh, you know, they're kind of the staple uh, nutrition course out there. It, you know, th it's in there. You'd have to kind of like dig and find the information on, on performance nutrition, but it, it is in their, in their textbook and in their course. Um, so there's one area to look there. Um, and then if you're just lurking to learn more about, you know, uh, assessing performance, conditioning and different things like that, um, our conditioning coach course is excellent in that sense because it looks at both strength, anaerobic fitness, aerobic fitness, and the different assessments that you can do from there. Uh, and I would say those are probably the top two paid resources that I can think of. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm biased on the conditioning coach because I was a part of it, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we did it because we thought we were filling a, filling a gap within the industry. So excellent. That's it. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything else before we part ways? No, I just appreciate everyone taking the time out of their super busy COVID-19 days to, to sit with us. And hopefully you got a few nuggets here. They're going to make you better trainers and coaches moving forward. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Hopefully we'll see you on another webinar soon. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye.